The German mathematician Gottlob Frege based his entire reconstruction of mathematics on something equivalent to naive set theory. Bertrand Russell was deeply inspired by Frege's work and influenced by it a great deal, but he wrote a letter to Frege in which he pointed out a problem. A problem that Frege realized was very serious. We call it now Russell's paradox. Russell said, consider the property of not being a member of oneself. <laughs> Intuitively speaking, if there is a set of all sets, it would belong to itself. It would be a set. On the other hand, the set of red things is not itself red, so it's not a member of the set of red things. Most sets are not members of themselves. The set of human beings, for example, is not a human being, so it's not a member of itself. On the other hand, you might think that some sets are members of themselves. And so Russell said, well, it should be well defined to talk about the sets that are not members of themselves. Let's introduce a predicate does not belong to itself. So X has this property of not belonging to itself, if and only if X does not belong to X. Now, let's think about how that would connect to our axiom of abstraction. Remember that principle said that the extension of every property is a set. So for any P, there is a set of all and only the things that have that property. That gets us into trouble because that implies there should be a set of all the things that have that property of not being members of themselves. Now, why is that trouble? Well, here's the idea, and it's a very simple argument. Making this substitution, not being a member of oneself, we can say there is an X, there is an extension now, such that for any Y, Y belongs to this X, if and only if Y is not an element of Y. So X is the set of all and only the things that are not members of themselves. Well, let's instantiate and let's call that X R. So then we have for any Y, Y belongs to R, if and only if Y does not belong to Y. But that's true for all Y. So we can substitute R for Y and we get that R belongs to R if and only if R does not belong to R. Well, that's disturbing. Okay, assume that R does belong to itself, then it doesn't. But what if it doesn't? Then it does. So we get a contradiction. Now that seems troubling. It turns out the set of all sets that are not members of themselves would have to be a member of itself and not be a member of itself. And so we face an outright contradiction. But look again at that little logical inference. All we've used are principles of universal instantiation and a move of existential instantiation, simply calling that set that is claimed to exist R. And neither of those seems particularly troublesome in this context. Though, as we'll see later, there may be a way of returning to this and saying, hmm, one of them is more troublesome than you might think in this context. But at any rate, Russell, and Frege for that matter, accepting those principles of quantificational logic, said there's no other source of trouble here except that axiom of abstraction. There must be something wrong with thinking that every property has an extension. In this case, even that every predicate we can form in the language has an extension, because after all, there's nothing particularly mysterious about this property. The predicate is easily expressible. We've got negation, we've got being a member of, and so we've got is not a member of. There's nothing ill-defined about that, it would seem at least. And so we're already in trouble. There must be something wrong with that naive, unrestricted axiom of abstraction. Russell said, if you have trouble grasping this, then let me tell you a story. Think of a village in which there's a barber. And here's the way the story goes. The barber shaves all and only those who do not shave themselves in the village. Well, hmm, who shaves the barber? The barber shaves all and only those who don't shave themselves. So if the barber doesn't shave himself, then he does shave himself. And if the barber does shave himself, well, he shaves all and only those who don't shave themselves, so he doesn't shave himself. So we're in the same situation. The barber shaves himself if and only if he does not. We've got a contradiction. Now, in this case, there's nothing deep in the logic that we have to revise. We just say, well, okay, they can't be such a village and such a barber. 
But similarly, in looking at set theory, we might say, well, then there can't be such a universe and there can't be such a set. Now, in one sense, that, I think, is the generally accepted solution. Yeah, there isn't such a thing as the set of all sets that are not members of themselves, because actually no sets are members of themselves, and that would mean that that set is simply the set of all sets, and there is no set of all sets. But it'll take us a little bit to get there. So for now, we can just say, it looks like we've got trouble, because just as there can't be a village and a barber, who shaves all and only those in the village who do not shave themselves. So similarly, it looks as if we cannot have a universe of sets and a set of all the things that are not members of themselves because it will turn out that that set has to be a member of itself if and only if it is not. So what do we do? How do we go about addressing the problem that Russell's paradox presents? When Frege got Russell's letter, he was deeply disturbed mind blown. And so Frege ended up concluding that his attempt to found mathematics on logic was a mistake. Now there are several strategies for trying to avoid this paradox. One of them, which Russell preferred, was to adopt a vicious circle principle and reject predicates like y does not belong to y. He rejected the idea of belonging to oneself or not belonging to oneself as somehow viciously circular. And he thought that there was a similar kind of problem that affects the liar paradox. This sentence is not true, for example. He said, there's, there's something about that kind of self-reference that seems disturbing. Now, it's not clear that that strategy will work in general. After all, lots of things are self-referential. This sentence is in English. That seems true. It doesn't seem absurd. Or you might imagine someone saying, this announcement will not be repeated doesn't seem particularly problematic. And so that sort of self-reference doesn't in general seem to be trouble. Moreover, we can hide the self-reference in loops rather than in self-reference in ways that make it seem highly contingent and odd to think that that sort of situation is impossible. So although Russell favored going in that direction, and there are indeed people who advocate type theoretic solutions to the liar paradox and to Russell's paradox and some related paradoxes. Overall, it hasn't gained general acceptance. A second strategy is one that Quine adopts later in some paper called New Foundations for Set Theory, which is a bit like that. He adopts a stratified approach and ends up trying to do what Russell was trying to do, but at the level of the language rather than the underlying universe of sets. The result of that turns out to be immensely complicated. It's been studied some, but understanding that language and its semantics turns out to be really a very difficult project. There are modern ways of doing this to say, aha, maybe just as we might say the problem is there is no such village having a barber who shaves all and only those who don't shave themselves, maybe the problem is to think about that realm and to say, here's the real problem. There is no set of all sets. There is no set of sets that don't contain themselves, but maybe there's something else. Maybe there is a class, or at any rate, we deny the existence of such an encompassing universe, something like denying the existence of the village. There are different ways of doing that. One is to postulate that it is a class as opposed to a set. That's something we'll talk about later. But another strategy is to say there just is no such universe. There are sets, but there is no such thing as a set of all sets or a universe of all sets. And so we can't make that move and talk about the set of things that don't contain themselves. There is no such set. That requires revising the axiom of abstraction and restricting it in some way, saying that we can talk about an extension of a predicate, for example, or a property, but only within the context of an already existing set. That is the approach taken by Zermelo, an Italian mathematician who develops a kind of set theory known as Zermelo set theory. It was amplified later by Frankel, who added an axiom of foundations to it, Zermelo-Frankel set theory. 
often supplemented in addition by an axiom of choice, and so known as ZFC, has become a dominant way of thinking about set theory throughout much of the 20th century. So we're going to talk about ZFC. We'll talk about zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice and lay out that theory. As we'll see, it becomes more complicated. And if we decide that all of this is taking place within a background theory of classes, as happens with von neumann gödel bernays set theory or kelly Moore's set theory, then we get an even more complex account. But we'll start by thinking about zermelo frankel set theory. I'll save that, however, for next time.